Back in the 80s there, there was a, there was a push for ponded pastures and uh, what it allowed you to do was basically drought proof your place. So exactly when you needed that feed in that dry time of the year, that dry brown time of the year, you've got this beautiful lush ponded pasture that you can pull back on. And uh, some of the local uh, grazers here uh, started developing it and, um, and obviously you're looking over the fence and, and the neighbours are saying, wow, look at that. That used to be all water and you know wasteland, ducks and whatnot. Now I've got a paddock potted pasture, and there's extensive areas of it in Queensland. Um, look, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful tool. It's a cattleman's dream, but it's a barrow's nightmare. <laughs> so the environmental considerations, I, I guess nobody really knew just how invasive those grasses can be. Um, we bought grass here from Markland Station, just down at Kamala. Uh, we bought it in a hessian bag, a couple of fertiliser bags, and in the 80s. Um, Little old me walked through there and uh, it was my brother and my father and uh, we planted the runners in there. We pressed them into the mud with our bare feet and um, the rest is history. <laughs> it's been very successful, <laughs> too successful almost. It, it takes landholders like Jason to be proactive and see, see the side or see the benefit that they can get from not only improving the environmental side of things but how some of the works that we're suggesting might also benefit their farming operations. Um, once, once that demonstration has occurred, uh, generally we find that many more landholders uh, are willing to take that on. So in terms of um, working with the, the pasture species like hymenacne in particular and paragrass and a few other the ones that can cause water quality issues, because they're so integral to the, to the farming operations, they really don't want to reduce the amount of cover that's that's on it uh, that's on their farms from a, an environmental perspective and from a fisheries perspective in particular hymenacne if left unchecked it can overrun wetlands modified and natural wetlands um, to a point where no fish will want to live in there the water quality by the end of the dry season um, in particular the dissolved oxygen is, is pretty much zero and then when you do get those rains the water flowing through those dense stands of hymenacne um, are so depleted in oxygen that no fish want to swim up there. So where we can work with a landholder like Jason where he, he's willing to create these refuge pools where um, it's deep enough for that the fish, so that the fish can persist into the dry season. The area of open water is large enough that the water quality can be maintained. So the hymenacne doesn't encroach so far in that it, it, it forms an impenetrable um, cover over the water surface because a large part of the water quality, in particular dissolved oxygen, is diffusion from the atmosphere. So where we've got windy days like today, you get a lot of um, surface movement on the water which allows the oxygen to transfer from the atmosphere down into the water column. It, this is the end of the dry season so it's about as much of hymenacne growth as you're going to get before the water starts receding um, and the water quality results were, were perfectly within tolerance limits so we had uh, over 80 percent saturation for dissolved oxygen, pH was fine within normal limits um, so the fish are very happy and yeah, we got many, many species um, captured today, which was great results.